All right, well, good morning, church. All right, Merry Christmas to everybody that's here and everybody that's watching online, uh, whether you're watching it live or later on. Merry Christmas, and I pray that uh, Christmas season is a celebration, uh, not only just to get together with friends and have pretty decorations and lights and presents and all that, but I pray that we never forget uh, what it is that we're celebrating, and that is the birth of our Savior. Amen? Amen. Amen. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to lift up the name of Jesus. So thank you for being here, for everybody that's in the room and everybody that's watching online. Uh, thank you for uh, just being a part of the worship service this morning. So if you will, let's stand together, and we're going to ask the Lord to come and be a part of this service this morning. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to come and, and uh, just uh, bless Brother Randy and bless the music this morning as uh, we try to bring him something of worth today. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for loving us and taking care of us, and thank you for just allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you for the celebration that we just celebrated, the birth of a Savior, the one that was sent to die as remission for our sins, something that we could never do on our own. You know, God is a just God. Sometimes we think things aren't fair, but that's from a human point of view. But God is a just God. And the remission for sin had to be given. And it began on that Christmas morning with the birth of a Savior. So thank you for that. Dear Lord, this morning I pray that you would come and just sweep over this congregation. I pray that you'll be with Brother Randy as he brings a message this morning. I pray that. Everything that's said and everything that's done, every note that's sung, every note that's played this morning, God, I pray your blessings on it. As we lift up the name of Jesus this morning, we ask you to come and be with us. I pray that you forgive us of our sins, the things we've said and done that are wrong, that we know are wrong, and we lay those things at the foot of the cross this morning. And all these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so how many people in the room believe that our God is alive? Amen. Amen. Let's give a hand clap of praise this morning for that. Right, that's exactly what this first song talks about. Christ is alive and he is alive in us this morning.
because he is alive and he's alive in us today.
believe that this morning, give him a hand clap of praise. He is Lord of all. The church may be seated. Well, good morning. And is it too late to say Merry Christmas? I still feel like I should be saying Merry Christmas to everybody. I don't know when that, you know, that actually ends. Is it at December 25th at midnight? But anyway, Merry Christmas. And if that doesn't work, good morning for you. So good. Thank you. So good to have each of you here today. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas with your family. And it just seems really right to me to be able to spend Christmas with my family and then come back with my church family and spend this day with each of you worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. And I do hope that you had a wonderful Christmas and just so glad to have each of you back today. Just looking forward to what God is going to do in the coming weeks and even here today. I do want to remind everybody that today we are still collecting for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. It's an extremely important offering that goes to support international missionaries. And so if you haven't given yet, please be sure to give. We have these offering boxes that are here by the doors. And we can also give online if you want to do that or through text. The information's there on the worship guide. If you're a guest here with us, thank you so much for worshiping with us. It is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. And you notice on the worship guide that in the corner, there is a little scan there. If you don't mind to put your camera through that, and it'll take you to a connection card. If you can fill that out for us, we would appreciate that. We are glad to have you here. Glad to have everybody here today as we are lifting up the name of Jesus. And so let's go ahead and pray and give this time over to him. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. So grateful for the weekend that we've had to be able to reflect on the fact that Jesus has come. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He is the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. And because of that, God, we know that Jesus came into this world to die on the cross for our sins and raised from the dead. And now he is our cornerstone. Now he is our hope and we don't put our hope in anything else. And so, God, I know a lot of people are going through a lot of different things and have a lot of different emotions today. But one thing is sure, that you are God. And I pray today that we would just be comforted by that fact, that you reign and that you are alive today. And I pray, God, that our voices would be lifted up to give you the praise that you deserve. And God, I pray today that as Brother Randy comes and preaches in a little bit, that we'd be drawn to the cross and that we would see you as more glorious and more beautiful than anything else, and that we would have more excitement and anticipation hearing your word than opening presents under a tree. And God, we do love you today, and just pray that everything that is said and done here would glorify your holy and majestic name. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. And at this time, if the children want to come forward, they're going to help us out in a song. Our congregation, if you will stand with us, we're going to sing about Jesus, Jesus, and how sweet it is to trust him on a daily basis. Jesus, Jesus, Oh 
trust Thee, precious Jesus, Savior, pray, and I know that Thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust
Amen. that uh, so very much and we love being here as a part of our church our church family um, second of all I normally would not uh, point out that somebody's not in church but this morning I, I think it's appropriate that this person is not here um, out of self-preservation um, I, I can understand why Larry Sandlin is not here this morning because he heard I was preaching again so um, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, anyway, um, um, I told him I wouldn't yell at him. He said, I don't believe you. Um, so, anyway, um, as we, as things start changing around here, as things start changing in our world, as, as we look at the economy, you know, how we'll look at our future, how things are going, uh, one of the big things that we always think about is um, how are we going to invest our money? You know, uh, things change. It used to be it was all about CDs or bonds or, you know, into a savings account. Now it's into, uh, then it changed to stocks and stock, the stock market, even though that's still a big part of how we invest our money. One of the big changes recently in the last few years is into cryptocurrency, whether it's Bitcoin or Doge or um, now they're even trading uh, trading virtual landscapes and JPEGs and investment and those kind of things, which completely not sure exactly how that works. But anyway, so as we talk about investments, you're like, well, hold up, Dave Ramsey. We're not, we're here for church. Not Just, just bear with me for a minute. Um, some people that we think of or some investment firms that names that we think of, you know, are like Charles Schwab, E.F. Hutton, Merrill Lynch. Those are some names that automatically, we automatically think about investments and money and, and financial things. Well, I'm going to give you all a couple of more of investors' uh, names. And you may, maybe you recognize them. I doubt it. Okay, but here we go. Um, names like Charlie Rice, Bob Roy. Mike New, Gerald Wilbanks, Chris Clark. Those men's names that I just listed are some of the most important investors that I've ever met. And those men that I just listed were people that invested in me when I was growing up. Those were my Sunday school teachers. One of them not, wasn't my Sunday school teacher. He was just an upperclassman in, in the youth ministry that, that just invested in me when I was growing up in church. And those men are far greater than any of the names that I listed before. And so we're going to look this morning, dive into that this morning about being an investor. Being an investor that is more profitable than Wall Street ever thought about being. And we're going to look in what it means to be an investor and what it means to be invested in. And how we can glorify God in both of those uh, situations. So if you'll do this with me, if you'll turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19. Um, and we're going to start in verse 19. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Japhat, and who was plowing through with 12, 12 yoke of oxen in front of him. And he was with his, the 12. Elijah passed by him, cast his cloak upon him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what, we, what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took up the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled the, their flesh with the yoke of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he rose and went after Elijah and assisted him. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for just this season and what it really means and about the love that is demonstrated through this season that you sent your son 
to die on the cross for us so that we could have a relationship with you. God, I, talked, I ask that you bless your word this morning, that as we talk about being, inve- being invested and in investing in people's lives around us, God, that we will see how you invested in us and do likewise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So here we have Elijah who um, has been out, been out and said, hey, God, God, I'm, I'm so alone, I'm so alone, I'm so alone. And God's like, no, you're not. I got you covered. And so he said, go this way. And, and God showed, God, as he's walking alone, along, God showed Elijah this new name, Elisha. Ooh, if you haven't figured out, Elisha was a pretty wealthy guy. Um, he had 12 yoke of oxen, so that means he had at least 24 oxen, if not more. And, and he's the back guy. I mean, he's not like the front guy who's learning and everybody's telling him what to do. You know, he's the back guy telling the other 11 what to do. And so he's plowing a lot of ground. So which means not only did he have a lot of oxen, he had a lot of land. So he's a pretty wealthy guy. And Elijah comes on, he just takes, it doesn't say that he even said anything about it. He just takes his cloak off and lays it up on him and, and then starts to walk off. And Elijah, Elisha's like, whoa, 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 hold up, hold up just a second. I dig what you're saying, and I'll be with you in a minute. Let me go back and say goodbye. And, and Elijah's like, well, okay, you know, okay, I don't know what, I, what have I done, you know. And it's not like he made a mistake. He was just like, okay, let's make sure we, we're on the same page. And Elisha's like, yeah, I'm good with it. So he went back, celebrated with his family, and then it says they went off together so that Elisha could assist Elijah. And so as we look at this story, we can see the two sides of it. We can see the Elijah side of it, and we can see the Elisha side of it. And we're going to look at both of those sides uh, this morning as we dig in. And so the first thing that we're going to look at is we're actually going to look at the Elijah side of it. And, And the first thing that we need to see is we can be the investor. We need to be the investor. We need to be the mentor to those people that are around us. That's what God called Elijah to do, to be a mentor towards Elisha. We'll see that there were other people um, in in this group, but Elisha was the main one. God has called us to do that. It's not just, it's not just sort of a, a, hey, this would be a good idea. God wants us to invest in those people around us and teach the people around us and, and help them grow in their relationship with Christ. Um, and as we dig into this, God showed him who to invest. It wasn't like, it wasn't like he just did any, many, money mo. He knew what he was doing because God led him to put his cloak on Elisha. But we see this through all, all um, throughout Scripture. If you look, you've got Moses and Joshua. You've got Naomi and Ruth. You've got Barnabas and John Mark. You've got Paul and Timothy. Throughout Scriptures, we will see these different kinds of things. And the thing about it is, is God will show us who we need to invest in. Okay? It's not going to be a random person on the side of the street saying, hey, God, God show, showed me that I need to talk to you. Okay, that's not exactly how that's going to work. What it means is this. As we do life, as we do church, as we go about it, we will run into people. We will bump into people and God's going to say him or her. That's who you need to invest in. And God will show us who that is. God will show us as we grow, as we go along and say, this is the person that you need to pour your life into. And obviously, the first thought is going to be, um, you know, our family. Well, I'm talking about outside of our family, okay? Outside of our children, outside of um, our sons and daughters. It's going to be someone else in, in the church. And so you need to start asking yourself, okay, if God has called me to do this, who is that? Who is that? And it's not so much about biblical knowledge as we're investing. It's not about biblical knowledge, but it's about biblical living. 
Okay, we've had a conversation. We've had a conversation, uh, my mom and I, and, and and my brother Jonathan recently about. I'll, I'll be honest. I, I knew Jesus had brothers, and I knew one of his brothers' names was James, but there are three others listed in there. And they're like, what? I didn't know that. Did that did that impact my spiritual development because I only knew one of Jesus one of Jesus' brothers' name? No. Did the people, did those people, those men that I listed earlier know that? I, I don't know that they didn't know that, but I'm pretty sure they didn't. But it's about investing in a person, not about getting them to know biblical facts, but it getting them to understand what it means to live biblically, what it means to live a godly life. Well, what does that look like? Because you're like you're sitting there going, okay, Randy, that sounds like a good idea. This good idea of of mentoring, investing in people's life, but I, I don't I don't know how I'm supposed to do that. I don't know what that looks like. That sounds pretty hard. That sounds like something you got to take seminary class for. I promise, it's not. So what does that look like? Talking to them. You're like, what? It's got to be more to it than that. No. It starts out just having a conversation. That guy named, I named Chris Clark. I don't know where Chris Clark is now. I don't know what he's doing. Like I said, he was a couple, uh, three, four years older than I was. But when I was in middle school, Chris always checked on me when I showed up for youth ministry stuff. It's like, hey, Randy, how's it going? And, and he just had a conversation with me. But because I knew Chris cared, I wanted to show up. I mean, not like I had a choice, you know, growing up in my house, but I wanted to show up because I knew somebody cared about me. A guy that really didn't need to because, man, he was like super popular athlete and all those kind of things, but he still checked on me. So it starts with having a conversation. It talks about, it starts with encouraging one another. It starts with checking in on them, praying for them. It's spending time with them. And you're like, okay, that sounds pretty simple, because it is. In fact, it's not really a formal thing. Because it's so much more effective when we casually invest in someone. When they understand that this is not a rigid procedure that I am following, but this organic relationship that we're growing together in the body of Christ. It's learning from one another and caring for one another. The common idea in that relationship, though, is Jesus. There can be many, many, many differences between you and that other person. But if you have the common goal of Jesus being glorified, man, that can make a tight bond between you and another person. In fact, like I said, Elijah and Elisha, they didn't have a lot of common when it started out because Elisha came from this wealthy family with lots of lands and lots of locks of oxen. And as you read about Elijah, Elijah, he was just a tishbite, which means he came from the wilderness. Pretty poor because he had chosen to be, God chose him to be a prophet. So he didn't really live a lavish lifestyle. And, and came from a completely different background than Elisha. But they formed this bond that Elijah could pour into Elisha. In fact, it's very similar. When I started reading this, and, I, and, and as I was talking about having a common goal, one of the, the relationships that I've seen out in culture, out in our world, is the relationship that John Wooden and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar had. Um, uh, John Wooden was a coach at UCLA, UCLA when uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, well, he was Lou Alcindor when he played at, at UCLA uh, back in the 60s and, and early 70s. Um, and, and then he went on to play for the Lakers. But I saw a video about five or six years ago when John Wooden was still alive that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, they were honoring John Wooden. And Kareem Abdul-Jabbar walked up to John Wooden, grabbed him by the hand, and walked him to the, to the platform. You could see that that mentor-mentee relationship there between John Wooden and, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was there, and their common goal was basketball. But then it grew from there. 
And so when we start to have a relationship um, with one another in this mentor relationship, our common goal is the glorification of Jesus. And then things will grow from there. Um, And then second of all, when you start this, when God's called you to do this, you've got to be persistent. Like, Like Elijah here, Elijah in this passage was like, okay, hey, Elisha, excuse me, Elisha's like, hold on for a minute. And Elijah's like, okay, but I'm still going to hold you. He hung around, and then he was like, okay, let's go. Elisha, Elijah was persistent in the pursuit of this investment. And it may not click right at first. When, you, when God has shown you someone that you need to invest in, that, that investment may not click right at first. It may not, and it may not just fall into place. But if God showed you that that's a person you need to invest in, you need to be persistent. And um, you need to keep at it. You know, of course, don't be overbearing. Don't be, you know, like, you're going to have a relationship with me. Rah. You know, you know, don't be like that, but be persistent. And even though that person may not know how to show it, people younger than you, whether it's physically or spiritually, want your investment. Sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't show. Sometimes it seems the opposite. But they want that. They desire that. And so you have to be persistent about it. You have to continue doing what God has called you to do. In fact, you may have to be the one with the greater effort. You're like, well, if they don't want my investment, then I'm not going to do it. No, you got to be persistent. Because they want it. They need it. And you're the one that's the mature one. So you need to continue the path towards that relationship. Um... But the thing about it is, is if that persistence is there, if that persistence is there, it's going to be rewarded. It's going to be rewarded. I saw a, I saw a tab, the table the other day that showed the investment of if you invested $1,000 in Bitcoin when it first came out. Uh, about the um, what it's worth now, and so in like twenty years, is that Bitcoin, one thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin when it first came out is now something like fifteen million dollars. Um, but the thing about it is, is like a lot of investments, it went up for a little while and then it dropped back down. And if you come out, if you'd bought out when it dropped so low that you were like no more, and not stay persistent with it, you would have lost. You know, $14 million. I know those numbers are big and hard for us to to grasp. But it's the persistence there in the investment that sees the greatest reward in the end. Okay, so that's the Elijah side of it. When we find ourselves in the role of Elijah. Now let's turn it around and let's see what happens when we're in the role of Elisha. We should want to be invested in. We should desire someone to pour into us. Let's look at the the next passage. If you turn turn over to 2 Kings, it's not very far. It's like four or five pages in my book, in my book, in my Bible. Um, 2 Kings chapter 2, we're going to read 9 through 14. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what shall I do for you before I am taken from you? And Elisha said, Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be. And as they were still... um, as, and as they were still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire, horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up in a, by a whirlwind into heaven. And he took up the cloak of, and Elisha took up the cloak of, hev, 
Elijah and had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he uh, took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, uh, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, uh, the water was parted on one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. Um, there is... I cut and paste it so it would be easy to read, and I think some of it got um, skipped out. Um, but, but anyway, and, and there's a part where Elisha's a reaction to Elijah being taken up. But as we're looking, at, as we're looking in here um, at this, uh, this passage, um, the thing from Elisha's side that we have to understand is that he treasured that relationship. He treasured the relationship that he had with his mentor, Elijah. Earlier in the passage, he, Elijah knew it was time for him to go. Elisha knew it was time that this, it was about over. But he was like, hey, let, let's not talk about it. He was telling his friends, let's not talk about it. We're not going to talk about it. And then Elijah asked him, hey, what are, what's, what's going to happen? And he's like, well, what, well, Elijah asked Elisha, what can I do for you? He's like, I want a double portion. And Elijah's like, well, if you see me get taken up, then, then it shall be granted to you. I mean, at that point in time, uh, Elisha is probably handcuffing himself to Elijah. He values that relationship. He's, he's like holding on to his coattail, walking where he's going. Uh, those kind of, he says, I'm going to go over here and sit in the shade. Elisha's like, I'm going to go sit in the shade. I'm going to cross this river. I'm, he's crossing the river. And he valued, he treasured that relationship. He knew the importance of the relationship that he had. Um, and wanted to stay with him. And when he asked for the double portion, it's not, it's not so much about Elisha as it is about um, the relationship that he had with Elijah and the relationship that he understood that Elijah had with God, and that's what he wanted more. He valued the relationship that he and Elijah had. And we need to understand that importance. When we are the one being invested in, when we are the mentee, we need to understand the value of having that person that is investing in us. We need to treasure it. We need to hold on to it. Sometimes when we look at some people older than us, or sometimes we look at things, uh, the people that are trying to invest in us, we may see that they're cranky. We may call them old-fashioned or fuddy-duddies or ignorant or things like that that they just don't understand. But I assure you, this is not the case. It's not the case. These people that are trying to invest in you have wisdom, have knowledge that they want to pass on. Back in the day, and it's probably still on, I haven't watched it much. Back in the day, one of the things that when we didn't have cable, when we just had over-the-air TV, um, one of the things that I would occasionally watch was Antique Roadshow. And, and there were two, two very good different things um, at, to watch on Antique Roadshow. Of course, there's the, the typical, hey, I found this, and I don't know, know that it's worth a lot, but could you look at it? And they're like, yes, it's worth a million dollars. You know, so exciting. And, um, and you're like, yay, I'm happy for you. But let's be honest, to watch Antique Roadshow, the other side of Antique Roadshow was the people that were like, yes, this was passed down from my great-great-grandfather who was in, you know, the president's chief of staff, and I think it's worth a billion dollars. And they're like, and that, that's like 20 years old, and it's um, worth two cents. They're like, oh. Um, those, those are the fun things to watch. Those reactions are fun to watch. But the thing about it is, is, is Elijah... Elisha knew that, and we have to take care that we value and understand the value of those relationships. We don't need to look at it as a burden that somebody's pouring into us. We need to look at it as something to look forward to. Proverbs 19.20 says, Listen to the advice and accept instructions that you may gain wisdom in the future. Those people that are trying to invest in you have knowledge that you don't know anything about. 
No, they may not have a high school education, a complete high school education. They may not have a college degree. They may have worked the same job since they were 18. But I promise you, they have life knowledge that you need. They have biblical living knowledge that you need. And you need to listen. One of the things that's gone away recently that I just... I hate that it's gone away in the last three or four, three or four years is our monthly men's prayer breakfast that we used to have at Beans and Greens. Man, um, Brother Ron and I were there the youngest by a lot, but man, that was one of my most favorite times of the year, of the month, being able to go and just be with those guys, and hang out with those guys, and talk, and just learn from them. That's what it means to value, treasure that relationship. And then, and then finally in this, we need to honor their investment. Not just to value, treasure the relationship that, that's there, but we need to honor their legacy. Um, Elisha took up Elijah's cloak and went on to do greater things. Went on to do greater things. I, I heard one time, whether or not, I haven't counted, so I don't know, I don't know where it, how it exactly lands, but it, it says when Elisha asked for a double portion that the number of miracles in the Bible that Elisha did versus the number of miracles that Elijah did was double. Um, I don't know whether or not it was, you know, that got to that exact point when that guy was thrown on his bones or not. But anyway, it says that, in, it, you know, that there was significantly more um, Miracles listed in, in Elisha's ministry than Elijah's. But the thing of what it was, was Elisha was going into the world, making sure that Elijah's legacy of glorifying God, of being obedient to God, was honored. He didn't do things the same way as Elisha, Elijah did it. He didn't do things exactly the way that Elijah did it, but he honored the legacy that was put, put before him. And so he honored what he was trying, what um, Elijah was trying to do about pointing the people back to Jesus. Well, not Jesus, but back to God. It's okay to do things differently. Like I said, Elisha did things differently, but the baseline was honoring God. The baseline was bringing glory to God. And at the same time, understanding what the people had set out before to do. Times change. Things change. Those people that, those people that built race cars in the 40s. If we were racing those same cars today, they wouldn't have a chance. But the race cars that they race today are extremely fast, but it still falls in line with the legacy of racing. Their, things are done differently, suspension's differently, the engines run differently. All those kind of things are different, but it's still about the same legacy. And the th same thing goes for us. We may do things differently, but we still have to honor the legacy that they set before, not for them, but so that God will be glorified. So that God can be praised by the continuation of ministry in his world. So as we look at this, we have to understand that we find ourselves in both places. You're like, uh, really? I, I didn't, before you, what we walked in here, I didn't even know one, what one of these places were. Much less both of them. But what we have to do is we have to... <coughs> we have to understand that God wants us to be both. As you get older, it's harder to find uh, um, that relationship um, uh, to be a, a mentee as you get older. But, um, but God wants us to be that. Um. 
I don't know. Some of y'all may know him. Some of y'all may not. Um, Gary Britton, he's, the, he's Mark Britton's brother. Um, and um, he's um, uh, the campus pastor over at uh, JSU. And um, in conversations that we've had, because I've been to, to him, with him to Cuba a couple of times, he's always talking about um, in our lives we need three people. We desperately need three people in our lives. We need a uh, uh, Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. Paul is someone to mentor us. A Barnabas is somebody that's at the same place we are to encourage us. And a Timothy is somebody that we're investing in. And I can't agree with that more. Who's your Elijah? Who's your Elisha? And how are you going to glorify God in that relationship? As we talk about this, as we come through this and we talk about this investment, and being a mentor or being a mentee is not something that's foreign to our outside world. Like I said, I gave the example earlier of John Wooden and Kareem Tuljabar. But when this relationship is centered around Jesus, that investment is tenfold hundredfold, thousandfold of what we think it might be because God's the one that is increasing the harvest because we are doing this together to bring him honor and glory. But if you don't know him, if you don't know who he is, then you come to a point that it's just about you and what you can accomplish. And I promise, compared to God, you can't accomplish very much. But He, that being God, wants to see us grow together, investing, loving one another as we do it. But if you don't have a relationship with Him, then it's not about Him. To have a relationship with him, you need to know him. And to know him, there's three steps. You need to understand that you're a sinner. Understand that you're a sinner and there's nothing that you can do to save yourself. Every single one of us is there. And you have to understand that sin separates you from God so that you can't have this relationship with another person, um, this mentor relationship, because you don't know who God is. Second of all, you need to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. Lived a perfect life. Died in your place on the cross. So that he could be a substitute for the sin that's in your substitutionary sacrifice for the sin that's in your life. And then finally, you have to confess him as Lord. Say, hey God, you're in charge. My life is now your life. Then, and only then, can you understand the importance of what it means to spiritually pour into another person, to grow closer to God together with another person as we go along. So that you continue to love God through your actions and how he demonstrates that love through us. So, if you don't know who Jesus is, um, Brother Ryan will be down here, down front. Um, you can come talk to him. We have some counselors over here that would love to speak to you as well. Um, if, and if you already have a relationship with, you, with Jesus, spend, let's spend some time in prayer saying, God, show me who I need to invest in. Show me who, who I need to find that is willing to invest in me so that I can live my life in such a way that you are glorified. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for loving us and sending your son. God, I just ask as we hear this message about investing in other people and other people investing in us, God, I just ask that you help us to find a way to that you are glorified in us through that. I pray for each individual, God, that they will find that person on either side of that so that we can go closer together and closer to you at the same time. In Jesus' name I pray.
Y'all stand. Band, come. Remember, if you don't know who Jesus is, come talk to one of the counselors, Brother Ron. I'll be down here if you would like to talk to me, and we'd love to tell you about him. If not, come down and spend time with some prayer saying, God, reveal to me who that person needs to be in my life.
Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Brother Randy, for the word today. An appropriate reminder as we are closing off 2021 and going into 2022 that as Christians, we need to always look for those opportunities for people to invest in and, and also people to invest in us. So I appreciate that. Thank you. If you grabbed your worship guide, there are a couple of announcements that I want to stress to begin with. Don't forget to give to Lottie Moon a very important offering. Also, there is no Wednesday evening service this Wednesday. We will resume the following Wednesday. However, we will not be having a first Wednesday meal during the month of January. Also, I am going to have a new member class on January the 9th. It's just a couple weeks from today. So please be sure to take note of that. If you have recently joined the church within the last six or seven months, or you're thinking about joining the church, you can join us during Sunday school. We'll meet on one of these rooms back over here, and it will be at 945, January 9th, 16th, and 23rd, and uh, it'll be a great time for you to get to know me, as well as get to know stuff about the church starting on January the 9th. And next week, we're going to be in a new year, and it's important that we start the new year off right, and I'm hoping and praying that you'll take church attendance and being faithful and make it a priority coming in for the new year, it is going to be a great, great year. I can't tell you, I have just anticipation like I've never had before about what God's going to do here at the church. And in the coming weeks, you're going to be hearing a lot about what God's laid upon my heart. And whew, I'm, I'm excited. So just come and, and don't miss that. Bring as many people as you can. We need to get back to where we need to be with the Lord and with what he wants us to do. And you're going to be hearing a lot about that in the coming weeks. And so with that, uh, does anyone else have a word of announcement that needs to be shared? Yes, ma'am. All right. So yes, there, there will be entertainment there for sure. Um, so this Tuesday, 9.30, if you want to help out taking down Christmas decorations, I hate to see them being taken down, but um, like she said, it's, it's a little bit of time before Christmas next year. Is there another word of announcement? All right. Well, it's been a good day, and I hope you guys have a great weekend just celebrating Christmas and, and what it means. And I pray that just as you wrap up this year, start thinking about how much God has blessed you. And, and you know, I'll, some of you have had some rough years. Some of you have had a lot of difficult circumstances. But every one of you have been blessed by the hand of God this year. And I think it would be appropriate just as the days move ahead that you take time to write out that word of thanks to God for everything he's done in your life. And so with that, we are going to go ahead and dismiss with a song, and Jeff and the praise band is going to dismiss us. So let's all stand together. God bless you for being here. Have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. You are